to the angel of the church in Sardis right? Now we know the angel, you know, the messenger of God to the church. You are an angel, a messenger of God wherever you go. The fragrance that comes off your life. Because that literal meaning is a messenger of God. Whether it be an angelic being or whether it be somebody, we are a messenger of God. So when you say you're an angel, that's actually kind of deep meaning there. <laughs> to the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the, of the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive. But you're dead. Seven, see, I've always found that really confusing, the first thing, seven spirits of God. I don't know about the Trinity, Holy, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then it starts talking about seven spirits of God. Whether that means a literal seven spirits and the manifestation, like in Isaiah, it talks about seven expressions of the Spirit, the Spirit of wisdom and the Spirit of this, and the spirit, lots of different expressions of the Spirit. Um, or whether it's just the complete wholeness and fullness of, of the Spirit of God that's talking about there. I'm not sure. But it says here, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. And there's been a little bit of a theme. Every time someone talks to Jesus, and now Jesus is speaking to the churches, what he's doing is cutting through the rubbish. You know, we put up a whole lot of rubbish in our lives, and, and facades. Um, there's the people uh, around us and what they see who we are, and that's somebody. And has a, a, a spectrum that goes so far. In, in their understanding of who we are. And other people come into our lives and they have a different perspective. And sometimes when worlds don't meet, it's interesting, um, in some settings throughout life I could have been seen as a shy person at times. In some settings. Why are you laughing? In other settings, I am, could, could have been, growing up as a kid, I could be seen as an out there extrovert type person. And the people in my world here would see me as such. And the people around here would see me as such. And that's true in all our lives to various degrees about how we're perceived and our reputation of what we look like on the outside. It's a range of spectrums. And even we can give an impression of who we are, that's not actually who we are. Some people uh, grow up and they, they, they do struggle with uh, feeling like they're an introvert, a made-up human word that classifies people according to extrovert, introvert, and all these types of things. And they have that label on them. And to push back that feeling that they don't want to be seen like that, they act... That's just died. They, they put on the facade of someone that's more extrovert. And so they learn the behaviour of being extroverts so that they learn that and in their life they're out there an extrovert. Everyone thinks they're such an extrovert when actually there's something deep and sensitive in them that's really who they are. And that's beautiful. But with God and whatever impression or reputation we have, and we can lead people astray with our own way that we are seen, God looks straight through all of it and sees who you really are. And he's not so concerned about the ex, ex, uh, external expression of what we're making ourselves look like. He is looking at the deep things of our heart. And that's what counts. And here, this church was very successful in having a widespread reputation of being a church that is alive. A church that other churches would have been aspiring to. Churches would have gone to their church to learn how to do church better so that they could have a church that also has the reputation of being alive. I don't know if that actually happened, but there was that aspiring. And our reputation in the community as an individual or as a church is not indicative of whether we are valid as a person of God or a church of God. We can have an amazing reputation as a church, yet not really hold any life in it at all. We can be a church that's valued and inspired to by other churches, but be completely dead in the eyes of God. But we can't, it's not like we're going for a bad reputation. You can also have a really good reputation 
and be alive inside. The reputation is nothing of, in and of itself. We can have a good reputation, we can have a bad reputation, we can have an in-between reputation, but that, that is not indicative of who we are as a church and who I am as an individual. If I get a great reputation over certain things, praise the Lord. If I don't have a good reputation over certain things, praise the Lord. Whether I'm favoured or whether I'm not, praise the Lord. And that's where God wants our heart to be. But it's very easy for me and for, a, for church or whatever we're in to go for first a reputation. We want a reputation. Now, something uh, from my perspective, all right? I've got a limited perspective. I've talked about how we can have a perspective on individuals and we can be led astray or think someone's as such. So I've got a perspective. And it's from my own experiences and it's not exhaustive at all. But from my own personal observations, from my 30, how old am I? 34 years. I couldn't remember the first couple, so you can take off a couple. Uh, in church, it's like, in my style of church, everything in church, there was this inference of chucking everything bad toward the church. Oh, I've got this useless bent paper clip. I'll give it to the church. Maybe they could use it. You know, that kind of mentality. My parents' uh, first church they pastored, uh, someone had a fruit business. Uh, no one gave anything to the church, really. Uh, but this... Generous family gave them some fruit and veg every now and then that they could not sell. And so they thought, I oh, know, we can give it to the pastors. They will deal with this rotten vegetables and rotten fruit that we couldn't eat. With it. There wasn't much left after you cut everything away. But that was like the mentality. Oh, it's, good. it's not good enough for me, it's good enough for the church. And that was wrong, right? It was wrong. And then it went the other way of excellence, excellence, excellence. Now we're giving everything that's the best to the church, which I think is a pretty good mentality. But what came with that and the pendulum that came with that was looking good, being good in the eyes of the world. Look, everybody in the community, look how generous we are. Look at our programs, look how giving and wonderful we are. See, we're not an irrelevant control freak church. We're a giving and great church and you should all be part of us. And the pendulum that, that can come with that is we're going for reputation so much that we lose the very foundation of why we're existing in the first place. And that's God. And a love for Jesus. And reputation, good or bad, it makes no difference in the eyes of God. Jesus had an amazing reputation at times. Thousands of followers. And at times he had hardly anyone that was willing to follow him. And it never deterred him from his course. Whether he was had a good reputation with success, bad reputation, he was called a demon, a chief of demons at times, he was lied about all sorts of things. It didn't deter him from his course. It's interesting, earlier on, the church of Smyrna, which we looked like, looked poor and they were under persecution and life was really tough. They were like the one of two or the only church that really was affirmed by God. Hold on to what you have. You're doing an amazing job. You're a valid church. You're alive. And so what it looked like in the church of Smyrna looked like, it, oh, I wasn't doing very well. God was saying, man, you're doing great. Keep going. But this church that everyone was like buying their books from and things like that, doing great things on the outside, Jesus going, man, you're dead. I don't even really want to go to your church. You know, the best what person that you want to come to your church is Jesus. If Jesus doesn't want to come to your church, there's a problem with your church. It's a shame uh, Thomas didn't go to church that one time when Jesus rose again. It's good to go to church, especially when Jesus comes. Fantastic. The church of Sardis... Was, in, was probably one of the least persecuted churches in all the seven churches. They were left alone the, the most. The, the city of Sardis was a fortified city up on a hill. Incredibly difficult to penetrate from an enemy. There was attempts over and over and over again. And uh, apparently, according to what I've read, the only couple of times in hundreds of years that they came in was when the guards were so complacent that they would sleep on watch and things like that and they managed to get there a couple of times due to complete complacency. And 
because they had this great sense of feeling safe. You know, the Bible, Jesus talks about persecution a lot. We really, if we're honest, don't suffer persecution in our society. We're meeting quite freely here. Um, I can see that none of you have been killed lately. Uh, yeah, yeah, check your pulse, right? We're not suffering this persecution like they were back then. And so we're in danger of being like this church, the Church of Silas. And it's good to check your heart every now and then. Where am I? Because we're not, okay, we, we don't want to, we don't pray for persecution, right? Who would want to do that, right? But we need to be alert. And what is something that Jesus said over and over again to his followers and his disciples? Stay alert. Stay alert. I'm going to come like a thief in the night. Stay alert. And so what this church was becoming was it was getting a little sleepy, a little complacent, a little bit complacent. And little things of the enemy of the world, worldly thinking, worldly pleasures, all sorts of things would just slip its way through because, you know, well, there wasn't any imminent danger or we're all good and everything seems to be going great and slowly they were dying. And in, and in, the, in Matthew chapter 23, I've just got to read this scripture um, because it it's really describes this church and, and what we can we can go for, just to sum up the point of reputation. It says, Matthew 23, verse 25, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! <laughs> you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee! Jeez, a bit harsh, isn't he? Blind Pharisee! Clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs! You look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside you are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. I have no idea why the Pharisees didn't like Jesus. <laughs> They had generation after generation. They were steeped into a system. Oh, no microphones. And Ray! I really can't. Go. <sighs> Good thing I've got a big voice. Can you still hear me? Yes. Can you still hear me back there? <laughs> Old school. Verse 2 it says, Wake up! That's a good point right there. Sometimes I feel so dull in this society, I feel like we need to do something dramatic. Maybe I should go overseas on a mission trip, not to help anybody but myself. <laughs> Sharpen up my senses of what's really going on in this world. A lot of our mission trips actually just help ourselves. <laughs> some are great, some are amazing, and I think God will use us wherever we go. But sometimes we need we need to snap out of our sleepiness as Christians. Oh, I wish, and I'm talking to myself. I wish I could just slap myself out of this sleepiness sometimes. It's like, come on, wake up! And we can tell our soul to wake up. If David can tell his soul to praise the Lord, we can tell ourselves to wake up. We can tell ourselves to wake up and then with our conscious mind we can love the Lord. You see, the instruction is not to love the Lord as it just happens so naturally, as it naturally flows without any effort. Sometimes we need to love the Lord Jesus with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and with all our strength. There's a few things that we sometimes need to get a hold of ourselves and go, come on, mate. Love God. Wake up. If we think that, you know, oh, God's just in control of everything and He is in control and we'll drift along and end up loving Him automatically, sometimes it doesn't happen like that. Sometimes by His grace it does. But He does say, love Him with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Do it. 
And so here I'm telling us today, and me included, wake up. Just because we're not under persecution doesn't mean the urgency of the kingdom of God isn't as prevalent as if someone was being killed as they are right now in Afghanistan. Was there 20 something people going to be killed today or something like that? In, in somewhere? It's happening all the time. They're awake. <laughs> they, I mean, even if they tried, they couldn't sleep. But for us here, yes, we need to give ourselves the instruction to wake up. The only hope that we have in this world is Jesus. That's the only thing we've got. And we sleep to that fact and we turn our lives into goodwill acts of making it look like we're good enough to the perception of others. Then we've lost everything. He says, wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Hold it fast. And repent. We hear that word repent so much in time we lose the significance. It's like repent. Basically your mindset that you've got now. Get that mindset. Smash it to pieces. Throw it away and get a brand new mindset. All your thinking is rubbish. Get a new brain in your head. Because that's the only way you'll be able to move forward. That's what repentance is. Get that mindset. All of your mindsets. Throw them away and go the complete other way. Because the kingdom of God is not a parallel alignment with the kingdom of the world at all. It doesn't curve and meet itself every now and then. It's a completely different mindset. And you know what complacency does, like it does to this church? It makes me start thinking about mediocre, rubbish, temporary things that don't matter. Like my body. Like the house that I'm living in. Like my possessions, all these cheap, stupid things that are going to wear out and cause me death and stress anyway. I can, complacency draws me into living for these stupid things. So it's stupid when you talk about it. But we actually live it every day. The reality of our day to day life serves stupid things. My reputation, how I'm seen by others, is a big one that I. That I want to have in my life. I want to be liked. I want a good reputation. I don't want to be put in a place of, you know, where, oh no, I'm going to have to mention Jesus and someone won't like me. Like, that feels a bit awkward and it's not good for my self esteem. <laughs> well, it's going to knock my self esteem so deeply. Maybe I'm not rooted enough in Christ. Maybe my confidence is not based in Christ. And that's a good thought to have. <coughs> It's about coming back afresh to God. It's like, Jesus, you are my strength. In you I can have so much confidence. If I get slapped in the face, I can turn the other cheek and get slapped again. Because I am so rooted in your love. You know, you don't have to try very hard to get your confidence in Jesus. It's all we've given for us. We've got everything given freely for us. We've got all the grace in the world. To enable us to walk day by day with Jesus Christ and following Him. It's amazing. You know, it might feel a little uncomfortable to be told, Wake up! Repent! Get all that worldly mindset. Stop serving stuff and reputation and things. And, serve. and that might feel uncomfortable in a moment, but it brings to such beauty. Suddenly you start living for something eternal. Suddenly when you start following Christ and you're finding life, there's no way back. When you're in that place, I tell you what, when you're in the presence of God and you feel Him and you feel close to Him, everything that you've been living for day to day feels like shameful. Like, what would I serve that for? God talks about how stupid we are as people. With one hand we use this wood and burn it in the fire. With the other one we make a jolly idol and worship it. We go, well, I don't make things out of idols. I wouldn't be that silly. But do you really? Are you really so silly sometimes, like I am? Some, this stuff, it's just whatever. Who cares at the end of the day? What matters? What really matters? Wake up! Strengthen what's about, what remains and is about to die. I found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come to you. Oh. How 
as a church do we stay alive with this pending doom and disaster if we don't follow him? Well, we can start by being honest with our heart to God. And every day, go, yeah, I was pretty bad yesterday and this morning and five seconds ago. And my heart just seems to want to go left and right and not follow you, but here I am now. Like, not come to God and go, well, you know, God, I'm all right. I mean, the people I hang around are pretty bad. So, that's all right, eh? That's cool. No, it's not all right. Who does that every now and then? Oh, well, I'm not that bad. No, we're not holy. We're not perfect. We go, oh, God, yeah, no, I've gone left, I've gone right, I haven't really been interested in you. Yeah, I've been totally consumed with the love of money. I've been totally consumed with this stress, that stress, whatever stress, going after this pleasure, whatever. I'm right here, but I'm here now. Two seconds ago I wasn't, but I'm here now. So, huh, what can you do with me? He can do everything with you in that moment. Because God's grace is more powerful than your stuff. When we walk by the law, then we feel like we need to take our heart and go, oh, hang on God, let me fix up my life first in my own strength and then I'll come to you. I'll hold a check, I'll come back. Let me sort some stuff out, I'll come back. No, just be humble. Be like, okay God, it is what it is, let's go from here. And God has paid for it. Jesus died on the cross and that was powerful enough for every one of our insufficiencies. There's no superstar Christians. There's just a bunch of basket cases that open their heart to Jesus. And then if you see anything great come out of anyone's life that follows Jesus, you can go, well, it was all him. If anything great comes out of your life from following Jesus, you can know if you're honest with your heart, you go, well, it was all him. It was all him. Because I know what my heart's like. And that's where we don't go for reputation. We go for loving Jesus. Because what can happen in our heart, even if we do succeed, and we are, we do get blessed, and I see it, you see it. And you see your heart go that way. You have some kind of blessing on your life, and it's been graciously given to you from God. You can turn that around and glorify yourself. You go, hey, well, this is all good, this is all me. Yeah, here's my uh, five steps to be awesome like me. You know? No, we're not awesome. But God puts favour on us and covers us and covers our shame and we become like royal children. Light of the world. I think, in all honesty, I'm supposed to be the light of the world. I'm thinking, what a joke. I walk around, you know, I put on a nice smile as best I can. But sometimes I walk around the place and I think, man, if all the hope around me is in me. Oh my goodness. Seriously. But you know what? That's the funny thing about it. It doesn't make sense. Yes, the hope of the world is walking around with you. Like, oh. It is that, it is encased in such a simple form. It's so simple. It's like, oh Lord, don't lead me to talk to anyone about you. Oh, please don't. Because I don't feel I'm in the right emotional state to talk to anyone, you know? Oh, I'm not there. Walking around the school, or trying to drop the kids off, being like, like <laughs> in the car going, oh, here you go. We're all got these insufficiencies about our life, and yes, it is that basic, and it is a mystery that the gospel can be contained in such fragile beings, fragile emotional beings. We're up, and we're doing probably not lying. Up and down and round and round and somehow God is able to use me in that. That's a miracle. God can use you too. Those that don't even feel any emotion. How can God use me? I don't feel anything. It's the mystery. It's a great mystery. <laughs> Yet you have a few people inside us who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. They didn't go and make their own clothes, did they? They were dressed in white, for they are worthy. Praise God. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. 
I'll never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Can you imagine yourself? You know who you are. I know who I am. Going and meeting the Father in all His splendour and glory and just feeling how small you are and how insignificant and insufficient you are. And then Him to reach out to you in all of that mess and clothe you and give you honour that you know you don't deserve. That's His heart for us. That's his love. The purity of his love. That's the heart of the father when the prodigal came home. He didn't want to hear none of his excuses. He'd heard people talk to him. He didn't want to hear any of it. He just said, oh, I'm going to give you honour that you don't deserve. You are my son just because of who I am. And God is looking upon us. And he's longing to clothe us. And he's longing to give us a new name. And he's longing to write our name in the book of life. And to see us shine as his kids. You know, if with my kids, I want them to shine. In my fallen state as a man and a father, I still want my kids to shine. If, we, if I know how to give a good gift to my kid, how much more does God, in the purity and the sincerity and of his heart, want us to shine? He wants you to shine. We are the light of the world, we are the hope of the world. We have eternity in our heart. Praise God. Yes. Yet we can, we can get distracted so easily from this beautiful thing that he's offering us. But, you know, right now, right here, we've heard it, haven't we? Yeah. Wake up! Come into his grace and move forward and be his light. And you might not feel wonderful. Maybe you won't get a, the best sleep in the world tonight. Who knows? But tomorrow, wake up and be the light of the world. Because it's not based on... It's based on what God is doing and working in our hearts. 